Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. All right, I'm ready. Praise the Lord, everyone. Thank God for you. Thank you all for joining. I'm so glad to have you. Do us a favor, like, comment, and share. Subscribe if you're on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. Turn on the notification. Uh, let your family and friends know the lighthouse is on. We are here in our Bible study. Uh, when the weather outside it's threatening and frightful uh, we have a delight uh, we will be here in the house of God bringing forth the Word of God so glad to have you uh, certainly give honor to God who's the head of our life and to Lady Eliaka and her absence and all of you those of you that are here with me in the congregation in the sanctuary glad to have you let's go into a word of prayer before we go into our Bible study Dear Lord, we thank you on tonight. We ask you to bless us through your word. Help us to grow and increase ever the more, oh God, as we learn to worship you and serve you and live for you with all of our heart, strength, and might. We ask this all in Jesus' matchless name. And every heart said, amen. All right, we're going to talk about rebuilding. Rebuilding, you know, our theme this year is rebuilding, restructuring. Um, and we're working from the inside out. We're working from the inside out, working from the inside out. Um, when you're building a structure, you work from the outside in. When you're a new home, a new building, new construction, um, and you can't work on the inside until you got the outside together. But when you're rebuilding, when you're rebuilding, in, mo in many instances, you are rebuilding from the inside out. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to rebuild from the inside out. And a part of our rebuilding is working on our spiritual man, working on our spiritual man. Yeah, working, working on our spiritual man. They're giving me some instructions because my volume is a little low. All right. Uh, is that better, team? Is that better? Yeah, we're working on the spiritual man. Uh, and, and, and working on the spiritual man, um, we want to work on those things that are pleasing to God. We want to work on those things that God f uh, calls acceptable. We want to work on those things that God intended for us to carry as um, children of God. And one of the things that's happened um, is in ne Nehemiah, 
Um, the walls of the city have crumbled. The gates are on fire. And anything um, that uh, the enemy wants to do, he can just easily do because there is no walls to protect. There are no walls to fight against. Now, uh, in Nehemiah's day, the, the Jerusalem walls, um, they weren't just these little um, one foot wide uh, walls. They weren't one foot wide walls. Um, these walls were 23 feet wide and it, encap it encapsulated the entire city, uh, that magnificent city of Jerusalem. These 23 foot walls so chariots could ride on top of these walls. Um, uh, archers and um, those with uh, bow and arrow, those with slingshots and uh, uh, catapults, those that can, they could catapult stones had they had that technology. Uh, it was a defensible city. It was defended well because of the 23 wide walls that it had. And its walls were not only 23 wide, but they were some 30 to 35 feet tall. So not only they wide and tall, but you have to, if you were going to knock this city down, you would have to scale the walls. Well, the archers would be there. Um, the fire throwers would be there. Uh, and so when these walls came down, it made the city, uh, it made the city indefenseless and made it a defenseless city that any enemy that wanted to ravish and set up another kingdom in that city was able to do. The other thing that um, impacted this, um, the people of God, is that the altar was broken. The altar, the place of sacrifice, the, the place where we render unto God our whole heart and we set our gifts and offerings, our sin offerings on the altar so that God would forgive us of our sins. The altars were broken. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter number 18, starting at verse number 30 through 38. I want to read to you um, what, what God is trying to get us to do. Um, 1 Kings chapter number 18, verse number 30 through 38. And it reads, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me, and all the people came near unto him, and he repaired, uh, underline that in your Bible, repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord and made a trench about the altar. And as great as wood contained two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in the piece and laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran down about the altar and filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God, of God in Israel and that I am the, thy servant and that I've done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust and licked up the water that it was in the trench. Now here it is. Um, uh, Elijah has um, rebuilt the altar. Uh, if you read this 18th chapter, you will read that the prophets of Baal had built an altar calling on their god Baal, uh, that god, the god of Baal that Ahab and Jezebel worship, uh, that god Baal uh, did not answer them, did not answer them. The, the prophets of Baal 
uh, at their evening sacrifice, at that morning sacrifice, they cut themselves to try to get Baal to respond. But Baal never responded. Uh, Elijah said to them, um, is he on vacation? He could be on vacation, so cry loud. Cry loud to Baal to see if he's answering. He might be on vacation is the reason he's not answering you. Uh, Elijah said, well, maybe he's using the bathroom. Maybe he's doing his business. Uh, cry loud so he can hear you in the restroom and come out and answer your prayer. And he kept mocking them and kept mocking them. He mocked them three times. And he says, where is this God of Baal? And they, they, the, the, the prophets of Baal, they stood on the altar and they jumped up and down on it. And they break the altar down. They broke the altar and no answer from Baal. And the Bible says they cried from early morning to evening. And then where we pick up in verse number 30 of chapter 18 is where Elijah rebuilds the altar. Somebody say rebuild the altar. I want to cover with you. This word rebuild and repair, um, the repaired altar, uh, the repaired art, al altar. We pair things so they can work together. People are in partnerships, businesses, marriages, ministry, and friendship are paired together. The prophet Elijah repairs the altar to restore the pairing between heaven and earth. I want you to see this. He's repairing the altar, rebuilding the altar to restore the relationship between heaven and earth. The purpose to repair the altar so Israel could encounter God again. And what's happening in our day and time is there is no real encounter with God. And part of our restructuring and rebuilding is so that we can have authentic encounters with God. So the Holy Ghost could move how it wants to move in our lives, in our church, not just in the building, but in our homes. We need an authentic move of God to happen in our lives where we can experience the full power of God and have revelation knowledge of what God wants to do in our life. We want God to have a restoration. We want to have our relationship with God restored. Israel has strayed from God and, and turned to worshiping false gods. Isn't that something? The people whom God had called out of Egypt, he had put his name on them. There was none like them in all of the nations. And God had done marvelous things for them, brought them through the wilderness, gave them a land of their own, destroyed their enemies, made their enemies their footstool. And after all that God did for them, they turned their back on the invisible God and made unto themselves gods that they can see made of silver and gold and wood and groves. And so they had strayed away from worshiping Jehovah God into worshiping figments of their imagination. Gods that were not really gods. They were just figments of their imagination because they went. The Bible says they went a whoring. They went after the gods of other nations, saying, these be the gods that brought you out of Egypt, saying, these be the gods that fight for you. And the Jehovah God, the only true and living God, sat back and said, I'm not going to put my protection around you. I'm going to let the enemy come in. And over and over, you'll read throughout the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, you'll see where God just let the enemy ramsack them and ramsack them because they did not worship him the way that he wanted to be worshipped. Listen, we cannot offer God anything and call it worship. But we, God has prescribed to us how we should worship. How should we worship? The woman asked Jesus, said, listen, our fathers worship in this hill, in this mountain. And the Jews say true worship should happen in Jerusalem. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, our, our fathers worship here in Samaria. 
And the Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem. She said, I'm confused about the whole thing, Jesus. I just don't know. Uh, should, I, should I listen? Should I worship here in this mountain or should I go worship in Jerusalem? And Jesus said to the woman, he said, the hour cometh and now is. Somebody said, the hour cometh and now is. Say it again. The hour cometh. And now he is where you shall neither worship in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. But they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And what God is prescribing to us is how we should worship. We should worship him in spirit. And when he says spirit, he means wholeheartedness. He wants us to worship him with all that's within us. Worship is beyond just lifting your hands and saying hallelujah. Worship goes beyond just clapping your hands and saying, thank you, Jesus. But worship is a lifestyle. Worship, I honor God in my lifestyle. I honor God in my conversation. Uh, some of the things you say, if Jesus walking aside, just walking alongside of you, would you say those things? Uh, some of the things you watch if Jesus was watching it was your was your date for the night would you watch that and Jesus was there so your when you worship in spirit you worship in everything that's within you that's pleasing to God and not just in spirit but in truth that when you understand what God brought you out of how he brought you out of darkness how your, the scales were on your eyes. You, you, you could not see truth. But God took the scales off your, li your eyes. And now you see truth. You're, you're not bamboozled. You know the things that are pleasing to God. Uh, you know that things that are not pleasing to God. Is my conversation pleasing to God? Is my behavior pleasing to God? Is my lifestyle pleasing to God? Is the way I walk pleasing to God? And when you understand that you're worshiping God in spirit and in truth then you have fulfilled the prescribed command on how to worship him so Israel had walked away from worshiping God uh, the true God and now they are worshiping him uh, they're worshiping false gods and then here it is our father who is in heaven hallowed be thy name your kingdom come watch this your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Matthew 6 9 and 10. So when we are rebuilding or repairing or restoring, we're restoring the place of worship. We're restoring our mindsets to worship God in the beauty of holiness. We're restoring our mindsets to become one with God, that we serve God in purity of heart. What do you have? What will you have me to do, O oh God? What, how should I live? Which way should I go? Whom should I talk to today? This is putting God into every aspect of your living. The place to meet God. An altar is the place, platform, or principle where man connects to and communes with God tangibly so communication flows both ways. This enables a living, viable, and dynamic relationship between humanity and divinity. The altar becomes the place and the experience of worship, sacrifice, connection, and an effective embassy of the kingdom or presence of God. In other words, the altar is a place I go to. It's a place I go to. I can, I can make an altar in my bedroom. I can make an altar in my living room. I can make an altar in my closet. Anybody got a closet they go into and just camp out? Any y'all? Do y'all camp out in closets? Uh, y'all got a little quiet place, a little quiet place, uh, the secret place that you go to. Uh, and you, everybody needs to, everybody needs to build an altar in your home. I'm not talking about stone and wood, a, a place of sacrifice, because the place of sacrifice, the sacrifice at the place of sacrifice is not a lamb. It's not a bullock. It's not a turtle dove. The sacrifice is you. 
Where do you put yourself where you become completely submitted to the will of God? That place is the altar. And so everybody should have a place. My wife, she, she, uh, she goes into her closet, literally the closet with her clothing and shoes and other doodobs. She goes in there, and that's where she worships. That's where she prays. That's where she seeks God for her next move. She goes into her closet. I come to the church. I come to the church. I go in the office. I walk around the building. I pray. I meditate. I sit in here inside the sanctuary. Um, this is the place I come to. Um, not necessarily there's no church going on. It's just me. Most of the time, by myself, I come in here and I, and, I, and I can feel God's presence and he talks with me as he ministered to me. Where is your altar? The altar is a place you go to to commune and to communicate with God. It is the place where you experience God in true worship. It is the place where you submit and you become the sacrifice. It is a place where you meet God. What is an altar? Uh, Webster defines an altar, uh, defines the word altar as a, a raised structure or place on which sacrifices are offered or incense is burned in worship. It's a raised structure or place on which sacrifices are offered or incense are burned in worship. The Hebrew word for altar is mizbah. Mizbah means to slaughter. The Greek word is thus I sterion. It is the place of sacrifice. So an altar is a place where I go to die to self. Come on, put that in the chat. It is a place that I go to die to myself. When I'm on the altar, I am no longer in control. I am no longer heading up the agenda. It is no longer my agenda. It's no longer what I want to do. And, and you, we can become so entrenched. Sometimes spiritually, we can become so entrenched, so um, deep-seated, so dug in to the way we think. We are sometimes married to the way we think. We're married to it. Have you ever just got into a mindset where nobody can get you off of it? You're married to a mindset. You're married to an idea. You're married to a way, well, that's just the way I am. No, baby, you need to get to the altar. You need to get to the altar because everything changes. Everything changes. The weather changes. The trees change. The birds change. Everything changes. Prices change. Rules change. Everything changes. You, 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 the, the altar becomes the place where I say, I don't know it all. I'm not, I'm not sure I know anything. The altar becomes the place where I die to my own ideas, my own mindset, my own behavior. And, and you know what? It hurts to die. It, it hurts. Change is not easy. It's, it's painful to change. I got to change this. Uh, you, you, you know about change because try to get in those pants you had 20 years ago. It's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt you to get in. Come on, y'all. Talk to me. It's going to hurt you. Uh, and you might, have to, you might have to all yourself up to slide in them pants. Come on. And try to get in it. Try to get in it. You, you be tucking and sucking all, all types of parts. Trying to squeeze into. Uh, no, change hurts. 
Change, church. You, we all change. And what God is trying to get us to do is to rebuild and restructure our relationship with him where he becomes central in our life. Let me say, let me say this. We oftentimes say that God is first. Is God first? My wife or children? My family second? My job third? Uh, my extended family fourth? my community, my church, six. And we prioritize like that. But God doesn't want to be first. He wants to be central. God wants to sit in the center of your life. And everything that's connected and drawn to you through your life begins to reflect the God-centeredness of your life. And now God becomes so prominent in your life that instead of making your family second, your marriage third, whatever you do, now you say, I can't see you. When you, when you make God first and you make your family second, your job third, your church fourth, all of that, then you can allocate so much time to each of them. But when you make God central in your life, you begin to reflect God in every relationship. I reflect God in my marriage. I reflect God in my family. I reflect God with my children. I reflect God on my job. I reflect God in my community. I reflect God in the church. I reflect God as I'm walking down the street. And when God is centered in your life, you reflect God in every relationship you have. So now people can say, I can see God in you because God is center. And when we are restructuring and rebuilding our lives to serve God, we are really making God center in our life. That's when I sacrifice because I'm doing it unto God. I, I press my way out to Bible study, even though I just got off work, even though I'm tired in my body, I'm making God center. I know that God needs to be center in my life, and so he's repairing me, and I'm going to lay myself on this altar. I'm going to lay myself on this altar, and I'm going to sacrifice my time. I'm going to sacrifice my sleep. We're sacrificing our meals. We're sacrificing our social media time. We're sacrificing our TV shows. We, uh, yeah, we, got, we, got, we got gospel music flowing in our houses. We got YouTube channel full of gospel music. We're not watching uh, Housewives of Atlanta, uh, Jersey Shore, Housewives of New Jersey, uh, Atlanta Housewives. We, 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 we're, we're listening to authentic messages from God by some of the best ministers in the world. We're listening to gospel music, music that's uplifting. That's what we're doing because we're making God center in our lives and so God wants us to lay ourselves on the altar to slaughter a place of sacrifice the word altar in scripture means a place of slaughter and sacrifice where blood was shed and death took place it symbolizes and acknowledges uh, the approach of the approach to an appreciation for God in other words when we talk about approaching God the place of slaughter we're really engaged in worship when you are engaged in worship you lose your identity when you're engaged in worship uh, 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 it's some things you start to do and, and, and when you're engaged in worship it, you, you're not as mean you're not as cantankerous and cantankerous. You, 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 you're pliable. When you, when, you, when you lay yourself, when we're rebuilding these altars and repairing and restoring our relationship to draw closer to God, that reflects in how I treat you. So when I'm engaged in true altar sacrifice, I, I, I'm, I'm not so quick to cut you off. 
Uh, I'm not so quick to love you with a long handle spoon. But when I'm engaged in worship, when I'm sacrificing myself, I put down my insecurities. I put down my fears. I even lay down the things that hurt me. And I extend love to you because I realize now that it ain't really me. It's not really me. It's, it's not re I'm not really to be this way if I'm going to be a real worshiper to God, but I've got to humble myself. And you know what? I got to humble myself even when somebody has done me wrong. When somebody is, they, they really stuck it to me. They, they, they beat me out some money. They didn't pay me back. They talked bad about me. They mistreated me. When I understand what real worship is, when I understand how to restore, restructure, rebuild my relationship with God, I understand maybe God was using them to help me get closer to them, to God. So I say, thank you, Lord, for somebody mistreating me. I say thank you, Lord, for somebody lying on me. I say thank you, Lord, for somebody that didn't pay me back the money. And I need my money. I say thank you, Lord. Maybe, God, you were trying to get me to the altar and I was fighting you. The, the, this First Kings chapter 18, the, the, the scripture says that Elijah cut up the bullock. We just read that like it's nothing. But I want you to think about this. I want you to think about he cut up the bullock. Now, the bullock sees the stones. The bullock sees the wood. The bullock sees the fire. And somebody is dragging that bull to the altar and you know that bull is snorting fighting tussling he doing everything defecating urinating cause what the bull don't want to be killed and laid on his altar he sees Elijah with the machete in his hand the bull, you, 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 you think that bull just came, I'm just going to sacrifice my life. No, uh, we, got, we got a little dog. We got a little dog. And uh, that dog, when he goes outside at night, he's, he's afraid. And he won't come in when I call him. So I make all kind of noise and he jumps. And he looking. And it's the fear of what's outside that makes him run inside. Even animals have fear. You think that bull seeing the knife, the wood, and saw them bell priests just kill his brother that was right next to him. You think this bull coming easily? That bull coming dragging. He doing all kind of things to stay alive. That's what's happening with us. See, our flesh don't want to die. It's pulling. It shows up in crazy ways. It's pulling again, but it's got to get to the altar. Because in order to rebuild and restructure the relationship with God, I've got to die. Say that, I got to die. I don't have to stop breathing. My will has to die. My ideas have to die. The way I am, that, that's, that's, just, that's just in my blood. Well, my mama was like that, so... If it worked for her, it's good enough. No, it wasn't good enough for your mama. It didn't work for her. Y'all not going to like me today. It didn't work for her. Uh, my dad, uh, my friend said, my friend said, uh, he said, my mother, she was 
mean as a junkyard dog. I said, she was. I, I knew better not to agree with him. I said, she was. He said, and she didn't get it from her mama. He said, she must have got it from her daddy. Because her mother was the sweetest person you can ever meet. Look at somebody say, maybe I'm just like my mother. Maybe I'm just like my father. And that's the you that's got to go on the altar. That's that one, the one you just like. That's the one that's got to go on the altar because real worship cannot happen when your flesh is in control. Real worship, you cannot experience true worship I'm not talking about the lifting up the hands. I'm talking about a lifestyle that's indicative, that's representative, that you have a relationship with God. Somebody say worship. The Old Testament altars, the altars in the Old Testament had no shape or form. The altars was made out of wood, bronze, or, or, or gold. The two altars that were associated in the tabernacle and temple were built from distinct patterns constructed by skilled craftsmen, Exodus 25 and 40. Offerings were made at altars, Exodus 27 and 18. Sacrifices were also made at, offer, at altars, uh, Leviticus 1 through 7. Uh, signified that atonement of sin was necessary before one could enter the presence of God. So, in other words, blood had to be shed in order to enter into the presence of God. Here are some notable people that built altars. And we're going some because in order to have a life that's connected to God, in order to have a life that's responding to God's will, in order to have a life that pleases God, we've got to learn how to come to the altar. And God is commanding us and, and dealing with us is that our, while we're restoring the walls and repairing the gates, we got to restore and repair the altar. We got to restore and repair the place where we communicate with God. When God talks to you, and you talk to God. Listen, I'm, I want to get away from um, coming to prayer services where we just pray out loud the whole time. And then after the, we pray from 6.30 to 7, 7 to 8, we all get up and walk away. But God said, when I'm going to be able to talk? The altar is a place where we communicate with God. And... There is no communication if it's one way. That's a monologue. There is no, the uh, United States NASA has sent out a signal into outer space hoping that an alien force will catch it and send a signal back. I got news for them. Ain't no aliens going to send no signal back. That's one-way communication. One way. And that's not communication. It's just monologue. But actual communication is an exchange between a listener and a receiver. And then the receiver becomes the listener. And the listener becomes the receiver. It's an exchange. It's a two-way. I talk. I make my request. God listens, God talks, he makes his requests. So repairing the altar is a place where we engage in two-way communication with God. Notice who built the altar. Uh, Noah built the first altar, Genesis 8 and 20. 
an expression of thanksgiving and deliverance when he brought him out of the 40 days of rain and 360 days of floating on the water. Abraham erected the altar, altars unto God in Genesis 12, 7 and 8, Genesis 13, 4, and Genesis 18, an expression of worship to God. Abraham erected an altar and offering of his son as a sacrifice unto the Lord right there in the now city Jerusalem, Genesis 22 and 9. Isaac built an altar, Genesis 26, 25. Jacob erects an altar. He erects two, Genesis 33 and 20, 35, 1 and 3. Moses erects an altar in Exodus 17, 14 through 6 as a memorial unto God. I want to stop there because uh, our next next week we'll finish up. But the altar, the altar is a place where God communes with us. And in this year of 24 of restructuring and rebuilding. Notice now, I'm not just restructuring. I'm not just talking about Lighthouse Church. I'm talking about your spirit. I'm talking about your soul. Our souls need to be repaired. Our souls need to be restored. Our communication, our relationship with God needs to be rebuilt and restructured. We've gotten away from the things that declare us holy and righteous. We've gotten away from the things that are pleasing to God. And in this year, we're going to rebuild and restructure. We're going to have defined times where we sit down and commune with God. We're going to pray. We're going to seek his face. And then we're going to listen. And we're going to walk by faith. We're going to live pleasing unto God. We're going to put away our agenda, our attitudes. That's, well, I ain't, I ain't changing that, you know. And, and listen, listen, let me tell you, it's, it's going to be painful to change. But it's needed to rebuild the relationship with God because God is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Let me ask you this. Say, say, um, say you meet a man and, and, he, and he's everything you ever, what uh, Whitney used to say, he's, he's all I got. He's all I got in this world. Uh, <laughs> he's everything. Let's say he's everything, everything you ever dreamed. He check all the boxes. And he said, I want to marry you. And uh, you agree. Or a woman, you, she, she agrees to marry you. And on that wedding day, he shows up in the baddest Tom Ford tuxedo money could buy. He got on some Louboutins. I mean, he, he, he looked like a, a box of chocolate. And then you show up in your wedding ground. It's got mud stains, ketchup, mustard. Your makeup ain't done. Your hair not done. Your nails not done. You ain't got no nice shoes on your feet. You think that man going to still marry you? He said, I didn't sign up for that. He going to say, I, I didn't. Now, we, we didn't spend all this. I gave you the money to go buy you a $30,000 dress, Vera Wayne dress. And you've been playing soccer and eating hamburgers and, and hot dogs in the dress before the wedding. You, your dress is all messed up. Well, that's how our lives have been with God. Here he is giving us everything and we show up at the wedding, been kicking mud, got all. He says, I'm coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Look at somebody say, how, how is your dress? It's, it's somebody, some of y'all need to take the dress to the cleaners. Some, some, some of y'all need to take the yeah, you, you, got, you got to start over because some things you can't get out. Y'all don't hear me. Yes, 
You something said a mustard stain, that's one of the hardest things to get out. Bleach stains, it's ruin. So, so God is saying, I'm showing up to the wedding ready to see my bride adorned in all the beauty and splendor. And you're showing up and you done played soccer, ran in the mud, done ate ballpark hot dogs, got ketchup stains and mustard stains, relish stains all over this 30,000 Vera Wang dress. That's what we're restoring. That's what we're rebuilding. Let's get out. And see, our hearts are stained. Our hearts are stained. It's stained with unforgiveness. It's stained with um, not allowing God to really heal the pains of our past. It's stained with disappointment. It's stained with fears. It's stained with things that are unpleasing. We don't let so much come in because the walls are down. And the gates are on fire and the altars are broken. And there is no place for sacrifice. There is no place for communication. We don't even know how to talk to God. Don't know how to approach him because we've let so much in. Well, I'm trying to get it out. Purge me, oh Lord. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Right. Here it is. God is trying to get us ready for a wedding. He's trying to get you ready for a wedding. And y'all had a wedding? Anybody had a wedding? Had a wedding? He's trying to get you ready. It's not going to be like your wedding. Because in your, your wedding, you was a groomzilla or a bridezilla. Yeah. yeah. You're just tripping. On the best day of your life, you're just tripping. A groomzilla and a bridezilla. Because men can be zealous too. But God is sending you a wedding coordinator. That's getting you ready to meet your groom. You know who your wedding coordinator is? Your pastor. He's getting you ready to meet the groom. And he, we, we got all the flowers. We got all the, we got the reception ready. We got the aisle ready. We got the runner ready. And, and the, you know, the wedding coordinator checks on the groom and the bride. And goes into the groom's goes into the groom's quarter and make sure the groom's been all set. Goes into the bride's quarters and make sure her makeup is right. Her hair is right. The dress is flowing right. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to get you ready to meet the groom whose name is Jesus. And I'm looking at your dress. And I, I got a little, I got a little oxyclean with me. And I'm going to get the stains off your dress. So when the groom who hired me, who hired the warden, wedding coordinator, said, I paid you, I commissioned you to make her adorn as a bride ready. And this is how you present? He'll get me. So I got I to gotta clean you up. I got to get the stains off your heart. I, I, listen, listen, let me tell you, I'm a coach. I'm an inspirator. I'm a motivator. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a rule maker. I set boundaries. I tell you, don't do that. I tell other ones, go ahead and do that. And no two people are the same. And it's up to me to know what you can and can't do. What will get you closer to God's per part of perfection? I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to correct you. That's my job. I'm trying to get you ready for a wedding. All right, come on, give God some praise. We thank you. <clears throat> Repair, restore, rebuild the altars. 
All right, if there's someone out there that desires prayer, let us know. Give us a hand emoji. Say, I want prayer tonight. I need some prayer. I need prayer in my life. I need prayer. If you're here, let us know. Say, I want prayer. I want, I want, I want to be prayed for tonight. I want to be prayed for tonight. I want to be prayed for. Uh, anyone wants to be saved? Anyone wants to be a minister, uh, a member of the lighthouse? Come on. Come on. We, we'll be glad to have you. We'll be glad to have you. I want to pray for every hand that's going up. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for every hand that desires prayer, every hand of salvation, everyone that's seeking salvation. God, you're making us ready to meet you. We, you're making us. You're cleaning us up. You're rebuilding us. You're restoring us. You're fixing our heart. God, you're teaching us right now how to let it go. You're teaching us how to let it go. Let go of everything that's not like you. Everything that hurts you. We're married to the pain. We're married to the hurt. We're married to the disappointment. But God, I came tonight to declare and to decree a divorce from the pain. A divorce from the hurt. A divorce from the disappointment. A divorce from those that did us wrong. Because God, we can't see you in peace. If we're holding those things against our brothers and sisters. So God, uh, we issue a decree of divorce to the pain. We issue a decree of divorce to the hurt. We issue a decree of divorce to the ones that treated us bad, that mistreated us. We issue it, oh God. It might have been 20 years ago. I'm still married to it. But I declare today, I'm divorcing it. I serve in a bill of divorcement. So I can become the bride that you called us to be. Bless us, O oh God, is our prayer in Jesus' name. And every heart said, amen. All right, it's blessing time here at the lighthouse. It's blessing time here at the lighthouse. Uh, we're repairing, we're building. I'm going to ask all of you that are able, able as the information is appearing on your screen, uh, if you're able to sow a sacrificial offering of $20. This is our sacrificial month. We are sacrificing unto God, and we're believing God that he's going to do miracles in our lives because of our sacrifice, because of our time, our talent, our treasure. We're pushing back the plate. Uh, we're sacrificing our, our seed offerings. We're doing things that we believe God is going to rich, richly reward us for. He's going to save our children, our family. Our family members are coming in. Look at somebody say, our family members are coming in. Say, get ready, saints. Our family members are coming in. God is doing an amazing thing in our church, and you want to be a part of it. Look at somebody say, if I were you, I wouldn't miss a service. I wouldn't miss a service. I, I, would, I would make up excuses to be at church. Sometimes we make excuses not to be at church. I would make up an excuse to be at church. Uh, we want to be here to see what God's going to do, how he's going to move, what doors that he's going to open. I want to pray with you as you're giving your offering on tonight. Dear Lord, we thank you for every offering that's being given right now. We ask now, God, that you let not one suffer for their giving, but God, we pray that you would multiply it a thousandfold, a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold, should men give into their bosom. God, we pray for increase, and we pray for a turnaround season in their finances. God, open up the windows of heaven, pour them out blessings that they will have room enough to receive. God, we believe we're living in a year of plenty. We believe we're living in a year of more, and God, we thank you for what you're about to do, oh God, how you're about to bless your people in mighty ways. We give you great, great, great praise on tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray and every heart said, amen. All right, on behalf of Lady E and myself, thank you and all of our pastors and the members of the Lighthouse. We're so grateful to you all. Listen, join us. Uh, we have leadership training tomorrow. If you're serving in any capacity in our church tomorrow, want to see you here at 7 p.m. Uh, I think the weather will cooperate with us. And so we want to see you here at 7 p.m. Uh, if you can, uh, be, meet, beat us here at 7 p.m. We have 6.30 prayer tomorrow, 7 p.m., our uh, Timothy training. So come out if you're a part of any capacity in our services, in our church. 
We want to see you at our leadership training. And then Friday, you don't want to miss Friday. We're going to have an exciting time. Listen, this is a month of sacrifice, so we're sacrificing. We're coming out more and more. Uh, we come out tonight, tomorrow night. Uh, Friday night is Saints meeting. We're going to have a shouting good time on Friday. You won't, you don't want to miss it. Join us. Join us here. And if you cannot, you cannot meet us here, beat us here on Friday at 6.30 for prayer and 7 p.m. All right, God bless you all. We love you to life. We'll see you all real soon. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Take care. Bye-bye.